Remember when the Argo used to start like this? Yeah, it doesn't do that anymore. In fact, it hardly starts at all. Today, we're going to find out why. So, for backstory, I put about 55 hours on the engine during our short deer season here in New Brunswick, and I pushed the machine pretty hard for that time. Um, I started to notice that it was getting really hard to cold start, and I believe it was only running on one cylinder, at least until it warms up. Actually, right now, it's not running on two cylinders at all. At the moment, it can hardly limp itself into the garage, so let's check compression and see what it says. First, we'll check the forwardmost cylinder. And yeah, that's not great. 75 PSI is a bit short of the 90 that this engine should have, but keep in mind that this is an old gauge and it's probably not very accurate anymore. Uh, what really matters is just the difference between cylinders. But this is the cylinder that's good, so let's check on the one that's bad. Now we'll give it a go on the second cylinder. And yeah, that's really not great this time. Looks to be about 20-ish PSI, maybe. Even if my gauge is not calibrated properly, and to be honest, it probably isn't, that's still not a difference great. of 55 PSI, so something is definitely going on here. So I don't know for sure what's wrong, but considering the fact that I have almost no compression on my rear cylinder when it's cold, but enough to run well enough when it's hot, sort of, indicates to me that this is probably a head gasket issue. That and it's only got 358 hours on the clock, so hopefully we're not going to run into any bottom end issues just yet. But no matter what the issue is, this engine is going to have to come out of the Argo if it's going to be fixed. So, I'll order up some parts and I'll bring you back when it's on the bench. With the engine now out of the Argo and onto the bench, we can start removing these tins to see the engine underneath. Next up is the intake. I really expected a fight here, so I soaked these bolts with penetrating oil to loosen them up, but surprisingly they came out absolutely no problem. So easily, actually, that the entire intake tried to hop off all on its own and I had to scramble to get the carb linkages disconnected. It's also important to block off any potential ingress points for dirt or other foreign objects when tearing into an engine like this. Just don't forget to remove them when you're putting it back together. Not that I would know about that. This is where things took a bit of a turn. See this loose bolt here? I'm not the one who loosened it. In fact, if it wasn't for the engine 10, which must have been holding it in place for god knows how long, uh, it would have fallen out a long time ago. I did test to see if there was any compression leaking out of that bolt hole. Um, there's not. But after placing my hand on the back of the cylinder, I can feel that there is compression leaking out of the head there. I can't explain how this happened, but fingers crossed this is a bad head gasket caused by a loose bolt and not a loose bolt caused by a very badly warped head. Next up is the flywheel. The flywheel removal is pretty simple. Just remove the pulley, take out these four bolts, and then remove your ignition. And finally, use a puller to remove the flywheel itself. You see those magnets that are stuck to the magneto, by the way? Yeah, they shouldn't be there. They should be on the inside of the flywheel, but we'll address those later. Before I take the heads off, I want to try to clean at least some of the 30 years worth of gunk and grime that this engine has accumulated. Um, I don't show a whole lot of this, and God knows I'm not going for a show and shine level here, but man, does it ever make a difference. All the head bolts for the bad side of the engine came out no problem, especially the one that wasn't threaded in anymore. It might not be clear on video, but I do crack the bolts loose with a ratchet manually before I use the power. What I saw when I took the heads off though, 
Yeah, that's not great. It looks like this cylinder ate something maybe. If you look at the individual impacts, it's clear that this was a recent event, seen as the marks are free from carbon. Looking inside the cylinder, I can see the same damage on the face of the piston. If I had to guess where the damage came from, I would say that a piece of the metal head gasket was probably sucked into the cylinder and then bounced around for a while. Before we go any further here, we better make sure that the cylinder walls are not damaged. After rotating the engine back so we can get a better look at the cylinder, there are some vertical lines visible, but nothing that you can feel to the touch. Considering this is basically just a lawnmower engine, uh, I'm not bothered about the thought of just honing this one out a little bit and installing some new rings. With the cylinder head off, it's now time to remove the cylinder jug. The jug is held on by only six half-inch nuts, one of which I'll leave at least partially threaded so that the jug can't just fall off on its own. Now, I did notice that these nuts are two to three times tighter on this side of the engine than they were on the good side of the engine. Once all the nuts are off, you can beat the jug off the motor just by using a soft blow mallet. With the jug removed, you can see where there was some sort of sealant that was applied at the factory. I don't really care for the application of sealant here, but it's something we'll get into later on. But first, I'm going to clean up the work area a little. This starter actually works fine, but I'm going to remove it and clean it off. Next, the remaining sealant on the mating surface of the engine needs to come off, along with just some general cleaning. Now it's time to remove the valves. These valves are actually in much better shape than the valves on the other side. You can see here on the exhaust side that there's actually very little carbon buildup. The other side of the ascension was really, really full of carbon when I did that one. Turns out that removing the valves on this engine is actually harder to film than it is to do. I don't have the correct valve tool for this. Mine is more for larger engines, uh, so it will hold the valve on this motor, but it won't compress the spring. In order to compress the spring and get the keepers free, I just use a flathead screwdriver or a small wrench to compress the spring. The removal procedure for the intake and exhaust sides of the valves are exactly the same. Just keep in mind that the intake side also has a stem seal that the exhaust side does not, which will also need to be removed and replaced. If we take a look at the valves, the exhaust on the left and intake on the right, we can see that the intake has some buildup on the stem, but both sides have a healthy sealing surface. If we do zoom into the head for a moment, it looks to be more or less the same story there. There are a few dull spots, however, but a quick valve lapping job should clear that up no problem. I'll also clean up this intake while I'm in here. Here is a quick side-by-side -side comparison of the valves. It should be clear that the valve and seat on the right look much better than the one on the left. There's a continuous mating surface all the way around the seat and the valve. If we look at the left side, we can see some discoloration in some places, which could be spots where the valve is not sealing 100%. Uh, I'll hurry up and finish the other valve off camera so we can move on. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do here is just lap the valve zone. If you've never lapped valves before, um, it's quite easy. All you need, of course, is your valve, and don't worry about confusing the valves. They are marked. You'll be able to see that one is marked exhaust there in the center. Uh, so you need your valve. Uh, you need a little bit of oil for the valve stem. You need your valve grinding tool, and you need your valve compound. So all we're going to do basically is take this compound, uh, which is a mild abrasive, and put a little bit of it around our valve here, and put that into the engine and let it seat, and use our tool to grind it back and forth. What that's going to do is take off a little bit of material on the hardened seat, and a little bit on the valve, and help them to mate perfectly together so that no exhaust gases uh, are able to get by. Next, we will turn our attention back to the head. I'd like to clean it off and take a look at the sealing surface where the gasket used to sit. If you look to the right, there does appear to be some damage where the exhaust gases were escaping during compression, so we'll clean that off and take a look. Once it's all cleared off, this is what we get. It's not perfect, there is definitely some deformation of the metal here, but I can hardly catch it with my fingernail and I think this should seal with the new gaskets. And on that note, actually, let's take a look at the new gaskets versus the old ones. Okay, so out in front of us are our two gaskets. On the left is the new gasket, on the right is the old gasket. Now the old gasket, at first I thought was a multi-layer steel, but actually it appears to be just a solid block of steel. And the new gasket, well I'm not entirely sure what this material is. It's uh, yeah, kind of like a metallic, but very flexible 
almost fabric-like material. Um, yeah, I don't know exactly what this is. I'm not 100% certain the quality. You see there's still a lot of trimming left to be done. Um, but I am glad that I've got this softer gasket because it will, it should anyway, in theory, I think, um, help us to seal up against the new mating surface a little bit. Um, so yeah, happy with that. Now that we know that the head gasket will seal, we can move on to the cylinder and the rings. There are a few vertical scratches in the cylinder, but I can't catch them with my nail, so we should be fine just to hone these out. I have already soaked the stones in the honing tool with oil, so we'll just add a little bit to the cylinder and we're good to go. Hard to get a good shot on camera, but the honing turned out really well. It took about 15 seconds or so with the drill on a low speed. Hopefully this helps with a little bit of compression and oiling for the new rings. Speaking of new rings, let's get to that. First, we need to remove the piston, which is only held in by small C-clips on each side. Once both C-clips are removed, the wrist pin that holds the piston to the connecting rod can be gently removed. With the piston removed, taking the rings off is simple. You don't need a ring removal tool to get them off, but it does make it easier. The two containing rings for the oil ring, however, are too small for me to grip with the tool. Taking a look at the piston, the skirts look to be in really good shape with hardly any wear. The same can't be said for the surface on the piston though, especially on the leading edge. It's pretty clear that a little bit of whatever this engine got in it, um, probably that head gasket, got stuck between the piston and the cylinder walls, at least for a little bit. After seeing the marks on this side of the piston, I can hardly believe the cylinder walls escaped basically scot-free. Okay, so it's finally time to start putting parts back onto this motor, and we'll start with the new rings. These rings, like most, need to be ground down to fit my boron piston. The specs for this motor are 10 to 32 thousandths on a used bore, which this one obviously is, or 10 to 23 thou on a new one. So if you've never done this before, here's how it goes. Take your rings and place them into your bore. Then use your piston to push them into a place where the rings would normally contact during the stroke of a piston. You can't leave them at the very top or very bottom of the cylinder because the rings won't actually touch there during a normal piston stroke and they tend not to be as worn as a result. So with your rings pushed down flat, and I'm just using a wrist pin here to make sure that my piston is pushing down evenly on the rings, you can measure your gap. As you can see at the moment, I have next to zero ring gap. So what I'll do is remove the ring, file one side of it with a small amount, and then recheck. And after a bit of filing, I have a roughly 13 thou gap, which is perfect. I'll repeat this for both compression rings, toss them along with the oil rings back onto the piston, and then turn my attention back to the cylinder. Before we can start putting the valves back in, we need to make sure that we're working with clean and oiled parts. If we trap dirt and debris in this engine now while it's going back together, it's in there for good. When it comes to putting the valves back in, having the proper valve spring compressor tool is invaluable, but I don't have that tool, so here's what I did instead. I compressed the springs with a vise and then held it in compression using two small zip ties. After that, just place it alongside the valve stem, place the hat on top of that, and then insert your keepers. A small bit of grease here really helps to hold the keepers to the stem until the spring tapes up the pressure. Uh, I did make sure to have eye protection on while cutting the zip ties holding down the springs, but apparently I should have had a mask on as well because it went straight into my mouth. Uh, doing the intake side is the same, just remember to put your intake valve seal on first. Before we go any further with reassembly, I want to show you why I mentioned earlier that I don't care for the sealant that was applied here from the factory. If you look at the surface, you'll see that even from the factory, some of the sealant tried to get into the motor, and on the other side of the motor, I found that some sealant actually did make its way in. So, for that reason, when I reassemble, I'll be putting in a thin gasket that was supplied with the kit, instead of reapplying sealant. And with that rant out of the way, we can continue with the reassembly by placing the piston back into the cylinder, and then onto the connecting rod. As a note, the orientation of the piston does matter with this engine. There should be a small arrow on the piston pointing towards the flywheel. Make sure you've cleaned the cylinder as well as you possibly can after honing, otherwise you'll damage your new cylinder walls and your new rings. The actual installation of the cylinder is pretty easy. By using a ring compressor to keep everything in place, you can gently tap the piston into the cylinder. This mallet handle is rubber over plastic, so there is a lot of give here.
Alright, with our piston being held in by the cylinder, we can place our bright green gasket back onto the block, which replaces that sealant I was whining about earlier. Uh, and then we can ever so gently tap our wrist pins back into place. Also, don't forget to put your keepers back on your wrist pins in order to keep them from moving out of place. And with that, our cylinder is ready to be reattached to the block. Just remember when doing this to turn the engine so that the piston is as far retracted as possible, then you can just push the cylinder the rest of the way in. Now, at long last, it's time to put our new head gasket in. Remember, the head gasket, the whole reason we started all this? Truth be told though, I'm not sure how I actually feel about this head gasket. It's not metal, and it's not as thick as the original. But, as of the time that I'm editing this video, I do have about 20 hours or so of runtime on the engine, um, according to the meter anyway, and so far so good. And there we go, with the head placed back on the motor and all the bolts tightened to the correct spec and in the correct order, the motor is ready to go. Well, it's almost ready to go anyways. I did the other cylinder off camera, but there is one more thing I want to show, which is a common issue on these Kohler motors. This is a top-down view of my flywheel, and you can see that the top three magnets are JB welded back in place. It's not uncommon for these motors to lose these magnets, which makes it basically unable to charge correctly. So in order to fix it, just check the polarity of the magnets and space them out more or less the same as they were from the factory, and then use something like a clothing pin to hold them in place while the epoxy dries. And from here, it's just a matter of putting everything back together and placing the engine back in the Argo. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to film any of that, so enjoy this B-roll footage of me taking the engine out, but played in reverse. And that brings us to where we are now. Also unfortunately though, it seems that somebody has walked off with my compression tester, so I can't show you a before and after using the same test gear. Instead, here is a quick shot of the Argo starting from cold. All that's been done here is a quick squeeze of the primer bulb to pump some fuel up to the carburetor. And I'm pretty happy with that. The machine is back to starting like it was new, and with about 20 hours on the clock since the rebuild, it's been doing very well. And that's it. The engine starts well, runs well, and makes good power. I was hoping to get some footage of the Argo driving through some trails this weekend, but with a week of bad weather and now a hurricane coming through this weekend, you'll just have to settle with whichever B-roll footage I've decided to put here instead. Uh, the next video that comes out should be of the International. There's been quite a bit done to that truck this summer, and most of the critical systems like brakes and clutch are just about finished, so that's pretty exciting. But in any case, uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. What are you doing in there, all chicky chew? <laughs> you sniffing the deer? You sniffing for deer? There's nothing in there, girly. Just some apples. Maximum care.